Now we go on to a success story, a brilliant success story of a country. And we have a brilliant man to do it. Israel and inventions started about 50, 60 years ago in the book that I mentioned to you in the morning. Do you know that Israel is the country where the USB pen drive was born? All of us use it. It has become as common as a paper clip today. You know? A simple invention, but what transformative power of innovations. The other few items that Israel is famous for is the Uzi machine gun. You know? <laughs> and lots and lots of defense and security equipment worldwide, which is at the cutting edge. It is also a good thing to know that, you know, Israel was also responsible for giving to the world the system of drip irrigation. A country that had less water, had lots of utility of water, and devised this entire system which actually saved their agriculture and created an entire new industry. The super iron battery, the new diagnostic kits for all kinds of applications. Rajesh ji, the number of diagnostic tools that are available in Israel today, if you get a good glimpse between some of these countries on healthcare sectors, so many of the diagnostic issues that we have can be solved at one hundredth the price. For example, non-invasive diabetic analysis by putting your finger and knowing whether you have diabetes or not. And several other aspects today are commercially available. And it reduces the cost of each diabetic checking to 11 pesa for a test. Similarly for anemia, which is a big problem in many parts of Gujarat. Also, Windows platform, NT and XP, both the operating systems were majorly developed in, in Israel. And they have developed a new product, which is quite interesting. Everywhere you go in the US, they make you remove your shoes for security reasons. So they have a special electronic bar where you just pass through it without removing your shoes. It's called Mac Shoes. And it does the same job as the X-ray does after removing your shoes. So problems are many. The question is we need to apply our minds to solve it. And this habit of entrepreneurship, this habit of innovations, is something that Israel has done so beautifully. And I think it's an outstanding, shining example in the world. And an outstanding man, Dr. Harry Yuklia. It is my proud privilege, Harry, to introduce you to this August gathering. He is from Technion University and is on the advisory board of iCreate. An academic and practitioner at once, Dr. Yuklia has been directly involved for the last 35 years in the remarkable build-up process in the Israeli high-tech sector. His career ranging from technology development, engineering, to marketing, to management, to consulting, as well as in investing. Dr. Euclia is an advisor to the Israeli National Economic Council, the Israeli Chief Scientist Office, the UNECE, and to Eureka, the EU Industrial R&D Network. Harry holds the MSS, MSEE from TUI, an MSM from Boston University, and a PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Once you get to know him, he's a great guy. But till you get to know him, we'll find out. Harry, over uh, to you. I was wondering uh, what you're talking about, Sunil, was listening about this wonderful uh, country and wonderful uh, uh, innovations. But the, the reality is that indeed in, in uh, Israel we think the way Sunil uh, uh, explained. And maybe this is why I'm invited in such a place to not only to explain the Israeli phenomena, but also to try to provide some clues for India. And I was wondering when I received the invitation and the title for my speech, who am I exactly to tell to so uh, many brilliant people what to do with in their country? Uh, so I'm not, uh, uh, I don't know if I, I will try to suggest a few things, but uh, not to really um, uh, give a, a strong advice. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not working for McKinsey, which means I have the privilege to have doubts about my own thoughts. <laughs> but but uh, being, uh, being in, uh, do, uh, involved in uh, policy design myself quite a lot, I was thinking um, actually, I started the dialogue with Jack on this uh, subject. Uh, you know, we talk about disruptive technologies and disruptive business models, and uh, it's amazing to see how little we, the consultants, 
change ourselves uh, in the way we look to analyzing. So, I, you know, I'm coming from a country which uh, if one will have to bet uh, 60, 70 years ago if this country will exist at all, probably null, no one will give even uh, one dollar on, the, on, the, on this bed. And uh, today, um, Israel is, uh, I think, one of the most sustainable economies in the world. Uh, and I hope to prove you that is because of the technology. Uh, Israel was created less or more at the same time as India was created by uh, visionaries. Uh, we had um, Ben Gurion, as you had uh, Mr. Gandhi. Mr. Gandhi uh, moved hundreds of millions of people um, in a one direction by um, telling them that they sh must produce their own salt. Would McKinsey um, recommend this strategy to any of the big companies? <laughs> well, no, I, 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 can, I can allow myself to say this because I'm an advisor as well to my government. Uh, so wouldn't uh, anyone um, uh, recommend to the Jewish people to create a state of their own in the Middle East? But we did it, right? So it's, we didn't have salt there. But, but we did other stuff, I'll show you what. Um, and um, I have two comments uh, uh, before I move to my, uh, uh, to my lecture just to, to, co to connect to the previous presentation. It was a question about how to change government behavior as a, a disruptive, yeah? Uh, and again, I want to tell you what we did. First of all, my advice, don't try. I mean, <laughs> governments don't change and they are the same everywhere. But what we did in Israel, at least, um, because we are less, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot less patient than you are here in India. Uh, uh, so we did a kind of uh, friendly divorce from our government, right? I mean, uh, we let them do what they want, and we build our country as we want. Uh, and this uh, is another, uh, uh, I think, plug-in into the entrepreneurial spirit that you mentioned. Guys, just go and take control over your lives. Don't wait for the governments. Right? This is my comment. And there is another comment about this uh, separation that in academia especially we use between the sectors, like we have the 12 disruptive technologies. First of all, uh, one shall ask why 12? Why not 9.5? Yeah, uh, but uh, why 12? Uh, but uh, secondly, you know, life it's uh, in academia also, we have these disciplines. Uh, physics, electronics, agriculture, economy. Uh, life is more complex. Never happens in one angle. So what I think it will happen as well is that uh, actually the holistic developments with of technologies are um, going to be the leading ones. Um, and as an example, because I don't have it in my um, lecture, uh, it was a discussion about robotics and healthcare, okay? One of the major problems of humanity for the next 20 years is the fact that we uh, get older because the technology improves our life expectancy, but we are, we'll, the society will have more and more ill people because there will be older people with more illnesses. Uh, so the productivity of healthcare today is very, low. Uh, we invest a lot in uh, robotics for surgeries and so on, but uh, we continue to administrate drugs to bo the body or eventually to tissues, not to cells which are ill. Now, the, what we develop now, a couple of companies are developing now uh, and universities in Israel is nanorobots, nanorobots, I mean um, uh, to the size of uh, microns, which will deliver the drugs to the cell. They will, they will go there, they will identify the cells which are ill, and they will uh, uh, deliver the drugs right there. That may not only improve the 
the, the healthcare, but also reduce the cost of farmers and the cost mentioned as well. So try to think my, my suggestion, especially for these young people there, which I spoke to them during the break, try to think differently than we, the old guys, tell you, uh, because it's your life. Right? And uh, maybe one day you'll work for McKinsey as well, but try it, <laughs> try it your, your own way. So uh, uh, now let, let's let, let get serious. I mean, uh, actually, Sanil, you know, this is as serious as I, as I can be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, look, I'm coming from a country which uh, uh, I don't see. What, okay, you see what I see as well. I see. All right. <laughs> uh, this country is is as thinny that if you if you look into the to the globes there, i I doubt you realize the very very small dot which is on the globe map, the, the Israel, the country, the, the size of Israel. Anyway, the population is about 8 million people nowadays. Uh, the, most of the people live in, uh, in cities, in the three big cities, uh, four today. The area of uh, Israel is about 22,000 uh, square kilometers the GDP is about to uh, 300 billions, and the G GDP per capita is in the range of 30K, $30,000 per capita. Um, I don't know if you imagine how, what it means, but um, do you know <laughs> what is the population size of Ahmedabad? I was told eight to 10 million, right? Is it correct? And uh, the size uh, is uh, less or more 20 to 23,000 square kilometers with the periphery, with the cities around, the urban area. So Israel is all together maybe the size of Ahmedabad. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm not saying that Ahmedabad is a small place. I'm saying <laughs> Israel is a small place, right? <laughs> Um, and we consider ourselves, despite being in, you know, geographically and geopolitically in Middle East, uh, we consider ourselves uh, as part of Europe, uh, mostly because they don't uh, want us so much in Middle East, so we have to go somewhere. Uh, and the Europeans um, relatively love us, at, at least compared to the other option. <laughs> So um, uh, you can see here um, the intensity of uh, high-tech investment or attract attractiveness, okay? How much venture capitals and uh, financial uh, instruments dedicated for high-tech funding invest in various European countries and in Israel. Obviously, uh, the darker is your um, color, the better you are. Um, and the, you see that we are living in a huge area of yellow um, kind of shadows. Uh, but um, uh, in Europe, at least, we and the, uh, Israel and United Kingdom are sharing as number one and number two in terms of entrepreneurial intensity, uh, each with about 30% of the total investments in high tech. So UK and Israel together take about 60% of the European funding in high tech. Depending on the exchange rate between pound and, and uh, shekels, uh, number one and number two are changing, but um, we are pretty doing pretty well there. So uh, this is the country, and uh, because we are in, uh, talking about funding and how technology, uh, how technology shape the, may shape a nation, uh, let me tell you the story from the perspective of entrepreneurship and innovation and technology. So the story of Israel is uh, like this. Uh, in fact, uh, that, that, was a, that was a Jewish state in that, in that land about 2,000 years ago. And like, you know, the history takes many rounds all the time. Um, most of the Jewish tribes had to leave 2,000 years ago. Uh, and it was in the cultural dimension of the of, of Jews always a dream to come back 
well, it was, was more, like, more like really like a dream. I mean, I don't remember uh, people really intended to do it, right? But it was a dream like this, uh, like, you know, like many of the cultural heritages that uh, uh, old um, uh, nations, like uh, the Indi various Indian nations are, uh, have, uh, there is something you aspire to, not necessarily intend to implement, but to aspire to, for about 2,000 years. Anyway, uh, a group of uh, visionaries decided uh, 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 about 100, 100 and something years ago to try to create again a, a Jewish state. And they call it um, Israel. Now, um, from the very beginning, this, um, this pragmatic dreamers, I will call, uh, decided that in the modern society, a modern state uh, uh, of the, uh, for, for the Jews must be technology uh, dependent or, or te technology based because the history of the Jewish people as well. I mean, they, you know, they had to go in many countries and they always were deprived of having the, their own assets or stuff like this. So uh, if you don't have land, you don't have any other assets, uh, the next um, thing you can use is technology. And this is how uh, uh, the state w came from the beginning. So in, in uh, 19, uh, the beginning of the century, the Fifth Zionist Congress uh, decided to, or called for the creation of a technology Jewish university in the land of Palestine, which was at that time, like India, governed by the British Empire, was part of the British Empire. And in 1912, the cornerstone of the Technion was uh, set on the Mounts of Carmel, uh, this is Mr. Einstein, which I'm sure you heard about, uh, who was one of the first presidents uh, of the Technion Society. In 1923, uh, in a visit uh, in Haifa, the Technion, uh, the, in, the, in the old campus of the Technion, uh, they actually um, decided to buy a piece of land. That was before the creation of the state, right? The state of Israel was created like India in 1947. Uh, so the, the Technion University, the first university in Israel and the, uh, was a technology university and was established before even the state was created. So before even having a political um, organization, the education came as, uh, in the first place. This is the old building in 19... It was built in 1924. You can see how I I Israel looked at that time, less or more. If you look behind the building, it's nothing there. Right now, this is the center of town of Haifa, uh, which is the third town in size in Israel. And in 1954, a couple of years after the creation of the State of Israel, the Technion moved to, to the new campus, which looks today less or more as you see in that picture. The now, since uh, 1960, the Technion graduates contributed between 35 to 60 billion dollars to the Israel economy. Um, in fact, um, one in any four uh, alumni of Technion is um, either creating uh, or uh, managing a, s a startup, one fourth. Okay, I mean multiplied by the amount of students. Uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, as a as a joke, when I uh, I was in, <laughs> it was an idea that maybe I will. I, I build. I'm uh, teaching entrepreneurial finance and the economics of innovation, just because I'm a, an engineer and an economist at the same time. And I was, uh, there are very few courses like this in the world. And uh, I was invited, uh, I mean, it was an idea to come here and give uh, uh, courses to some universities. Um, normally my class is uh, between 20 and 40 students. Uh, they are less or more 80 subscribe subscriptions and I try to scare a couple. <laughs> so I get a, a good quality of students. So, uh, and, um, the people here talk about 800 students in my class if I'm coming to teach. <laughs> so this is the size of the, 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 you know, the difference in magnitude. 
Now think about having one, 25% uh, of uh, Indian IIT and IIM graduates uh, starting their own startup. And think about the impact on the Indian ecosystem. Anyway, for Israel, it did pretty well. I mean, uh, we have uh, about uh, the high-tech industry employs about 8% uh, of the workforce and contributes about 14% to the GDP. So it's very heavily, very good return on investment, I'm talking about uh, educating students. Uh, some economic models which we build show that the people graduating next year, which is the uh, to about almost 3,000 uh, graduates uh, um, and will create during their career, their life, for, for Israel or for other countries, but they will create between 1.76 to $3 billion uh, in net present value. Uh, think again, if we talk about somebody, it was a question about the education system, think again where to invest your money in education, technology education, or, I don't know, building some casinos, some, I don't know, <laughs> bedding points. Um, and we have the, obviously, very, um, very, how shall I say, high quality uh, intellectual rewards as well. Um, three, I think there are four already Nobel Prize winners. Uh, which are coming from the Technion. Uh, by the way, there are about 11 altogether in Israel, uh, which is, the, I think, the highest, also the highest yield of uh, nations in between the Nobel Prize winners for uh, science. Um, here is Dan Shechman, the latest one, uh, the, who got uh, the, the 2011 uh, Nobel Prize for the discovery of the qu qu quasi crystals. And um, do you know what Dan is? Uh, oh, he's a colleague of mine, yeah. I didn't mention, but uh, uh, do you know what he's, is he teaching nowadays? Oh, he got the Nobel Prize for the, his research 30 years ago. What is he teaching nowadays? He's teaching entrepreneurship. He, he believes that uh, engineers and uh, scientists must leave the ivory tower and do something in the society, and this is what he's uh, dedicating his time to teach entrepreneurship by scientists and engineers. Well, still we are in Middle East, in, the, in our region, and in our region, as you can see here, you are rich if you have natural resources, oil and stuff like this. Till recently, when we discovered also some uh, gas, uh, reserves uh, Israel had just sand. And if you have sand, what you do? You develop a silicon industry, right? So, <laughs> so Intel has a plan there. <laughs> no, but it's not th that sand, all right? And anyway, Israel is, so, so in the Middle East, either you, are, uh, you have oil and you are then rich, or uh, you don't have oil and then you have um, wars like the Syria, and uh, you know what happens nowadays. So uh, this is the natural choice, I would say, there. Um, Israeli, Israel, the Israelis uh, took another angle and uh, choose differently. So we started um, doing something. And we didn't accept that the fact that we don't have natural resources must stop us, and we did something else. Uh, so, and uh, you can, as you can see, we are doing pretty well, despite not, not having any oil uh, so far, and anything else actually, which even the, the state itself was created on unproductive soil. I mean, the, the agriculture was not there. Uh, the, 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 the Zionist Congress acquired um, land from the uh, Ottoman Empire, and, uh, which, and they sold, obviously, the, the sand, stuff which was not productive. Uh, and then um, you'll see what happened in the meantime. I mean, Israel today is one of the leading uh, economies in uh, agrotech. We actually produce almost everything we need ourselves. 
Um, by the way, about 60 years ago, before the Startup Nation book was uh, written, uh, the Israel was famous uh, for the export of um, uh, Jaffa oranges. I don't know if you had the chance to eat Jaffa oranges. This was an Israeli brand name. Today, if you want to buy uh, Jaffa oranges, you can buy them, yeah, you can still uh, buy the Jaffa oranges, except that they are produced in Spain under, uh, under Israeli license because it's too expensive to produce oranges. So we do other stuff. And here is um, something to think about. Um, the most lucrative period, I mean the most intensive buildup period in the history of Israel was the, the, well, this uh, 20 years between 1985 to 2005. Uh, the GDP per capita in uh, 1985 was uh, in the range of $6,000. Uh, in 2005, it was around $20,000. Today is $30,000 per capita. So we are, we are really a lot, lot richer. And all this happened um, under very adverse conditions. Uh, at least uh, mathematically, because we, Israel uh, sustains an 8% spending on defense, has to. Do you know, by the way, how much United States spends, or how much, I mean, the more, the, great, the largest defense systems are spending as their budget, do you know? It's about 1.8 to 2.4%. So the superpowers spend 2 to 2% 2 in average of their uh, GDP in defense. Israel has to spend 8%, uh, which obviously decreases the nominator. And during this period, we also um, had to absorb about uh, an increase about, of about 20% of our population from 4 million to 5 million due to a massive Russian immigration. So that um, decreased the denominator. Uh, uh, obviously, that was a very good um, immigration group, which today is productive, but uh, at that time, at least mathematically, there were very adverse conditions. I mean, I mean the, again, M M McKinsey would say, well, we, <laughs> we don't have, uh, this is not sustainable, right? Uh, it's not sustainable for about 30 years. Still, still we are still uh, not sustainable. But uh, uh, why I'm, I'm pointing this out, because uh, this is a very dramatic, I mean, you know, today uh, there is uh, also India, but uh, China, uh, Brazil, there are all these countries which, which have a very high economic growth, which is great. The question is, uh, is it based on something which is sustainable? And as, I, as, as you'll see, um, in Israel we found later that uh, actually investing in, in technology as a base for the economy is very sustainable. Um, again, I'm not giving advice to India, but think about it. You'll get maybe to the conclusion uh, where is the best to spend your next dollar. Uh, not the government dollar, as I said, uh, the next dollar for your kids or for your, I don't know, families. Um, where do you want to invest it? Think about this. And again, if you are not still convinced completely, let me show you what happened over 50 years. Uh, this is the GDP per capita of Israel, the red line, and the blue line is the high-tech export in percentage out of the industrial export. Now, uh, one shall see by eye the full, uh, uh, the full uh, uh, correlation of the two. So if we are re indeed richer, uh, at least financially or economically we are, maybe not intellectually, but uh, economically we are richer, that's for sure. Uh, that is for clearly because of the, um, the high-tech sector. And let me give you a couple of uh, examples. I choose a couple of examples that may illustrate how the high tech, the industry, the entrepreneurship, the innovation, and the nation, the formation of the nation went together. Uh, Iskar, 
is a, I don't know if you know ISCAR. It is a, okay, so ISCAR is a, um, um, let's say a factory, a metal work factory. Uh, like many have seen uh, on the way to the airport in this small, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's really started as a, really started as a um, home, let's say, home business by um, Steve Wertheimer. Steve Wertheimer was one of the first, uh, he was a, man, a member of parliament in the first parliament. He doesn't have even a formal academic education. He's uh, immediately after the, the second war, he came to Israel, he was uh, building a society, right? And then um, it was this call, the best should go to technology. Right? We had, a, we had a, we, from time to time we changed this uh, slogan, but we have like periods in which we say the best to the army, the best to technology. Now we want the best to academia. But anyway, he was a member of parliament, so without even, even education, he left the, political, the, the politics and started this small shop, producing um, all kind of, you know, um, cars for the defense or whatever, he, metal work. In time, um, is is uh, is is car build a, a plant for very accurate, very precise blades, which were used for many applications. In '68, all right, so '52 is four years after the establishment of uh, of the state. Uh, Steph leaves politics, goes to build a, and starts building an industry. Uh, at that time, he was just solving a problem. He was, wasn't thinking about a big uh, company, but um, he realized, uh, he identified a niche and started working on, it, on this. In 68, um, one of the companies he formed, Blades Technology, which was a, um, a kind of merger or joint venture with uh, Rolls-Royce and uh, Pratt & Whitney for their large engines was established, and today, Blades Technology is one of the largest manufacturers of such components for the uh, um, turbofan engines. Now, uh, his car was then started from an, a, a, a dream or, uh, or let's say a pragmatic approach of one person and became one of the leading players in its um, sector. Till uh, in 2006, his car was acquired by Warren Buffett. It was the first acquisition of Warren Buffett in Israel. And this is a quotation of what uh, Buffett said at that time. Again. Nobody talks about his car because it's not in the mobile and um, smartphone stuff business, but it is, it was sold for about $1 billion, maintaining all the employees in Israel. So they, it's not like in other cases, the, the operation, not only that was not um, expatriated, but was actually the operation increased. And uh, it is still, uh, Warren Buffett uh, this year is still rep in the annual report, they said that this is one of the best investments um, Berkshire did in all its portfolio. This company, by the way, is fully operated, is uh, not fully operated, but they, they, they mostly operated by robots. It is in the north part of Israel in a not so much populated area. And Steph Wertheimer made another, he's famous for, uh, actually for a different approach. He builds this kind of high-tech parts in poor areas. This is, a, um, this is an area with heavy um, Arab population and a lot of Israeli Arabs work in these countries, okay? So he has a couple of parts like this. Uh, the latest one he was built in Jordan together with the Jordan government. So this is the social dimension of the high tech. Okay, Steve Wertheim, the Wertheim started as a politician, went to the industry, and now he's actually 
uh, active back into in society by using, leveraging the industrial prestige uh, to build a society which is, you know, clean and uh, based on ethics and so on and so on. You heard already about Netafim. Netafim is the company which invented the drip irrigation. Um, so now everybody knows, uh, well, drip irrigation. Obviously, um, if you are a farmer and you want to irrigate, you use drip irrigation. You don't just you know, pour water. However, all this started as, uh, I think s s uh, you mentioned this, um, because uh, some a guy who was working in a kibbutz, kibbutz is a kind of cooperative farming, okay, something very Israeli uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of the creation of the state. And uh, he wanted to save water. The, the, the water is scarce in our uh, area. He wanted to plant more and had a certain uh, quantity of water which was allocated to him. So he was thinking how to better use the water. So he installed all these pipes and made by hand, hold in the past, okay, <laughs> trying to regulate the amount of water which uh, the crops get uh, by just doing uh, this with even not technology, just, you know, trying to um, make holes of various sizes in the pipe and uh, get pressure. Uh, that is 1965. Uh, this uh, met te technology uh, appeared to be very uh, lucrative. And right now, um, about 80% of the land in Israel is um, irrigated by this Metafim uh, technology, and more than 3 million acres in the uh, United States are actually uh, uh, using Metafim methods. But Metafim today is already deep into the broader solutions of water management and farming and uh, greenhouses and so on. Um, I know that they are active in India. Uh, they have uh, uh, here large operations. And uh, again, towards the future. A couple of years ago, I used to give my students um, as a project to take technologies be, uh, of scientists at the Hebrew University. At that time, I was at the Hebrew University. And money, try to build a monetizing plan for them. A couple of guys um, took a, 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 from one of the professors who developed a protein for pharma, pharmaceuticals, right? Uh, and one of the assistants realized that this protein the somehow is um, um, reducing the amount of uh, um, film which is created in, in, by bacteria, certain bacteria in the pipes. Okay, the, the problem of netafim, for example, is that uh, in time, after seven years or something like this, all these pipes must be replaced. Now, these guys um, came to a, the idea, why don't they use this protein, which was for pharma, to uh, extend the life of the netafim pipes. They, they went to, to netafim. They signed with them. So they form, first of all, they formed by themselves. My students formed by themselves as a startup. They signed with the Hebrew University uh, a license for for uh, 15 years to sell this technology in for this industry. They went to Netafim and signed with Netafim a license to uh, use these proteins uh, as a fertilizer together with the fertilizer in order to clean the pipes. And uh, they uh, shared the, the profit. Right. So that was the business model. These students never touch the protein nor the pipes. <laughs> they, they just did all the work connecting this scientist. I mean, this professor was a lady which I, when I asked her, okay, what do you, what is your dream? She said, well, I, I need a microscope. It cost fifty thousand dollars. I mean, this that was her, her, you know, economic value, uh, perceived economic value. This is that that, that has a value of a uh, few hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars, right? which Netafim and these guys are uh, now sharing. So this is like the how things are extending. And that is the last one, um, which I think might be very highly relevant to, uh, to what you, what, what one of your problems here. Skytran is actually a, 
a technology which was developed by a couple of scientists at NASA. Um, it is a new way of transportation. We spoke about energies, batteries, electric cars, and so on. But in fact, this is how it looks like. Yeah? But in fact, uh, we may think why do we accept as obvious to drive cars from one place to another? Or why do we ex think that public transportation me means mass transportation, like big, big buses? Skytrain is a company which is now um, uh, in Israel. I mean, this, uh, the CEO is an Israeli which worked in NASA, and uh, he's sitting there. And uh, here you have a comparison between various, the cost of various types of transportation, uh, urban transportation. It's basically a cabin flies on, it's actually like a small plane, because flies on magnetic field. I mean, it's not, the friction is very slow very low, uh, on trays which can be installed very easily, of course, you know, uh, around the streets. And just uh, you, co you uh, the combination with the software, I mean, you call your cabin on the phone, you wait there, the cabin comes, no drivers, nothing like this. It's mo less or more like small, small cabins, okay? Now, this is um, a pilot. Uh, the, the Israel aircraft industry is now involved in this as well, to build a first uh, testing pilot in in their camp. And the Tel Aviv um, municipality actually is running now a project of a, a couple of uh, kilometers to use it in Tel Aviv. More interesting, in Kotayam, India, there is today, uh, there are discussions between this company with uh, the municipality and people there uh, to build this pilot track of 30 kilometers into phases and then to extend it. So my friends in uh, Ahmedabad, yesterday from the airport to, <laughs> to my hotel, <laughs> I, was, I couldn't think again and again how good it was if that system was in place there. Again, is 10% uh, of any other comparable system you can imagine, except walking. Uh, you can walk, obviously it's cheaper. But otherwise, it's by far a lot more effective. So, an idea. This guy is ready to come here to, well, talk to whoever. Okay, so what, uh, what, what next? What uh, Israel next? I mean, we are now in the mood of sharing our knowledge, okay? If people uh, think and we realize that uh, apparently what we did there is interesting and it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, inspiring, we said, well, finally we have an asset that people want, and it's not Uzi. It's not only the Uzi gun, right? <laughs> people want the Uzi gun, right? But, uh, but we have uh, other stuff. And this is the knowledge how to build ecosystem. Um, so you can see here uh, the, our cooperation with iCreate, for example, right? I mean, when iCreate came and said, well, can you help us? We immediately started a partnership. But so is with um, other countries. And on your right side, for the students, which for some reason, I don't know why in India, students are already all the time sitting on the back. I mean, you, I mean, you, you go somewhere, right? I mean, you, you, are, you must be on the front of everything. So take, uh, take the front position, all right? The front seat. The students must be on the front seat. Do you agree? I hope so. All right. So um, for students, we have this kind of modules which we created at the Technion, which are specially designed for cooperation with the local universities. And we will have a couple of uh, meetings during my trip this week here. But also we work on possibility to do, to educate and for, to do for more than education, formation of entrepreneurships, which uh, the entrepreneurship is very much locally rooted, right? I mean, you can't do, don't try to do what the Israelis did because it's something else, yeah? But you should do your own way, but you can get some help from there, right? So the idea is to have the formation here, but have the experts coming to for short periods to, to work with us. So um, this is something that we offer nowadays. Um, we have with the Cornell, we build a, a new technology, the uh, university in, uh, in New York. It's actually starting operating nowadays, this year, but uh, it's going to be the largest uh, technology university in the uh, East Coast. 
the Cornell Technion Innovation Center. Um, we, the campus was supposed to start operating in 2015, but uh, the a April offered for five years for free two floors in their headquarters in Manhattan to get started already, and the first course is just started this October. So if anyone is heading towards, um, by the way, the first operation is an incubator for post for uh, postdocs in multimedia from around the world. If you have such people who want to develop something, they can go there. Uh, they get a grant and everything uh, for six months. To the first, the next uh, series starts in um, February, and um, we try. It I create to do the same at a different scale, so, but this is, this is the idea, to, to offer this kind of spaces. Um, and also recently, we are now going to build a, a Technion University in uh, China, in the province of uh, Guangdong, which will, by the donation of uh, uh, Li Kaxing, I don't know, this is a very rich uh, Asian person, who donated uh, uh, the money for, to build this university together with, um, I mean, it is a Technion Institute, it is a Technion University, but it obviously will be operated together with a local university. Uh, there is another interesting model that we may apply here as well. And this is something that we do with uh, high school. I mean, we realize that the, the education and the formation of entrepreneurs start a lot earlier. So the Technion now offers summer camps for entrepreneurship and science. The first one started last um, summer. So this summer we have already three camps like this <laughs> because I, we try to limit the number of students there. But this is, uh, the idea is to have the tech Israel and the Technion in particular as a global center of entrepreneurial and technology formation for everyone who wants to not to be at McKenzie, <laughs> not to work for McKenzie, right? No, I, I shall tell you, I, I mean, my, I'm, uh, I'm an advisor to the National Economic Council in Israel, which is at the Prime Minister's office. No, prime, my, uh, our Prime Minister, which is not my, uh, doesn't belong to my political party, uh, but I'm not a politician anyway. But um, again, we are in good relations. He loves McKenzie. <laughs> So this is uh, uh, this is the reason I uh, I uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> use maybe more than uh, what politically correct is uh, the uh, uh, sarcasm and my cynical uh, part of my personality, right? <laughs> don't take it, don't take it personally, right? <laughs> it's um, so this is my, my point. Now, uh, there is no advice, or no cause to direct, at least, advice to India, because I don't think that this is what we shall do. I mean, we are Israelis. What works in Israel will not work exactly like this in India. But I try to give a couple of suggestions. Now, if you want to discuss these suggestions and come from your perspective to us and get an opinion, a friendly, very friendly opinion, you are invited. So thank you for your time.